Hello and welcome to ATP Report. We are very honored to have as our special guest today uh, a very famous rabbi, Shmuley Boteach, who is known as America's Rabbi. He has a new book out, uh, Holocaust Holiday, which I'm very pleased to announce, tells the story of the Holocaust from a first person's perspective. The rabbi actually took his family there. You've written three dozen books, which is extraordinary. Welcome, Rabbi. Let's start off. Tell us about your new book. Well, Holocaust Holiday details a trip with my kids, uh, my wife and my children, to uh, dozens of uh, sites of mass extermination. Auschwitz, Birkenau, Sachsenhausen, Mauthausen. Uh, places that just uh, bring to mind unspeakable horror. And the idea was that my kids should be exposed to these places, even our eight-year-old daughter, in order to, that they should understand never again, must be never again, and that the six million cannot be forgotten. And some of the stories are just very poignant, like our eight-year-old daughter, her birthday is uh, July 3rd, the day before the 4th of July, you know, saying to us, you know, Tati, Mommy, please, whatever you do, I don't want to spend my birthday at Auschwitz. Wow, you know, I mean, eight-year-old daughter says something like that. So instead, she spent her birthday at the, at the Lodge Ghetto, not much better, where 275,000 Jews were murdered instead of 1.1 million, as, as at Auschwitz. But the uh, book is out in a month, and uh, we'll see. It was, it was, a, it was a harrowing journey, and, but I hope it's an inspirational tale. Unbelievable, and I would encourage all of our listeners and viewers around the world, please go get this book. It documents the history of not only the rabbi's family, but my family as well, especially in regards to Auschwitz, and thank you for doing that. So BDS is on fire across America, on college campuses primarily, and it seems to be beaten back frequently, but it's one step forward, two steps backwards, three steps sideways. There's a story out now about Leila Khalid. Um, she was one of the prominent leaders of the uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. She was one of the hijackers in uh, 1969 of TWA Flight 840. Um, she would have blown the plane up. She rolled a grenade down the hall uh, uh, of the plane, and but for the Israeli commandos who happened to be on the plane, she would have brought the plane down and killed herself. Uh, she was convicted uh, of half a dozen charges, and astoundingly, she was let out of jail in a prisoner exchange. And now she's a hero as a freedom fighter, Rabbi. And right now they're debating her coming to American universities because she has an alternative reality to tell and under academic freedom, that should be okay. What do you make of it when somebody that's a convicted murderer like her literally is just someone to debate on a college campus instead of being in prison where she belongs. What is it today that makes it okay for someone that wanted to kill hundreds to be on a college campus? Well, think about the irony of us discussing this on a day where Derek Chauvin was uh, found guilty of, uh, of second-degree murder and uh, George Floyd and three and third-degree murder and manslaughter. Could you imagine if in a few years' time, if he were to be released, if he was suddenly lecturing on university campuses, the uproar? It's, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Well, she's so much worse because that was premeditated murder. Um, she was a terrorist who was, whose entire purpose was out to, to, to murder people. Um, it's unthinkable that Derek Chauvin would be welcomed as, uh, as some kind of hero. And it's unthinkable that Leila Khalid would be welcomed either. The difference, of course, is that uh, Jewish life is so often trivialized that if you murder Jews, you kind of get away with it. And I think that that responsibility falls upon our community that we allow this to happen. That the Jewish students at campuses around the United States are not protesting this outrage is itself outrageous and has to be reversed. Absolutely. It's, it's disgusting beyond words. And in my same opinion about disgust, uh, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, who was elected for a few year term and he's still there, never left, probably stolen billions from the Palestinian Authority, lives like a king, is a, con in my mind, uh, a murderer. He's been paying, paid for slay Palestinians to slaughter Jews for decades. Seems to think that's a great idea. He gets invited to J Street's convention a couple days ago 
and makes a speech about how Israel is a military dictatorship and needs pressure from the United States to change their policies. He's welcome in open arms. How is it possible, Rabbi, that J Street, who supports BDS, has a terrorist as a keynote speaker, and the Jews, some of them support him, and non-Jews support him, and them, J Street, as if it's just a political dialogue. Well, you know, one of my favorite TV debates that I've ever done was uh, against uh, the head of J Street on CNN. Uh, it was a morning show, and uh, they're an interesting organization. Um, they've outdone themselves this year at their convention, because not only did they have Mahmoud Abbas, as you say, he runs a kleptocracy. It's not just about how he enriches himself, but his sons, Yasser, Tarek, they're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. They control the cigarette trade. They control uh, construction. Um, he's actually not good at stealing because Yasser Arafat was a billionaire and he's only worth hundreds of millions. <laughs> it's a shame that he's not like better at it. Because yeah. you know, Arafat died, one of the richest men in the world. But uh, So Abbas needs to do, we want to see him be more effective in, in pilfering uh, the international aid that goes to poor Palestinians that makes him a rich man. But uh, J Street has outdone themselves this year because you know every speech that you read about was like Elizabeth Warren and uh, Bernie Sanders calling for the end of, of aid to Israel. And I think they've done a very effective job of having a, having a convention uh, that has condemned Israel thoroughly and completely. And uh, it just goes to show you actually just how out of touch J Street is because uh, we would never believe that a day would come when the UAE or Morocco or Bahrain would be more pro-Israel than J Street, but that day has come. And you know, enough said. Uh, I'm sure that Arab countries look at these conventions and they kind of wonder, you know, what's up with the Jews that they have all these conventions that are that are condemning their own? But I find that uh, it would be it would be laughable if it wasn't so tragic. Well, let's let's talk about how bad it really got, Rabbi. They gave their peace prize to Jimmy Carter, maybe the worst president in American history in regards to the Jewish state, who thinks the Jewish state is as bad or worse than South Africa at the peak of their apartheid movement. I mean, that's an abomination that I can't even describe and relatively compare to anything else. And yet Carter was there and he gets the prize for being such a great peacemaker. He hates Israel and is no friend of the Jews. Does this organization truly want to see Israel destroyed or not a Jewish state anymore? Or what's your take? I, th I think you need, for J Street, you, you need to look at their relevance to the American people as opposed to just their irrelevance to the Jewish community. Jimmy Carter wasn't the worst president in American history vis a vis Israel. He was simply one of the worst presidents in American history, period. <laughs> he was utterly repudiated by the American people. He lost in the landslide to Ronald Reagan. Uh, he is routinely uh, ranked by American historians, you know, the top uh, two or three worst presidents. I should really say the bottom, the, the bottom of the list. You know, he's there with Warren Harding and with, uh, um, I gotta think of some of the other, <laughs> Miller Fillmore and all these forgettable presidents. Uh, and uh, his legacy is uh, Ayatollah Khomeini coming to power and uh, not being able to foresee the rise of, uh, of Islamic uh, terrorism. Uh, his legacy is the American Misery Index. <laughs> um, so, you know, I kind of feel sorry for Carter because I think he was always a well-intentioned man. He wanted what was best. And yet, what could he do? Uh, he failed as a leader and the president. And I think it's really nice of J Street to, to try to rehabilitate him <laughs> when no one else seems to really want him. Well, on that subject, Rabbi, you, you raised a point in an earlier discussion you and I had that American Jews don't seem to be comfortable with really defending their brethren, both here in the United States and overseas, their extended families in Israel. Why in the world is it? I used to do network shows every week uh, on a major national network, and I used to get asked the question all the time, and it, get, it became so embarrassing for me because I couldn't explain why Jews wouldn't stick up for Jewish issues. And they were more progressive than they were Jewish, as if that's a competing religion. Well, look at, um, look at um, the Mormons versus the Jews in terms of even just philanthropy. 
So something like 90% of all Mormon philanthropy goes to Mormon causes, and 10% will go to other causes. That, that's also a function of the fact that you have to tithe, etc. The Jews are the exact opposite. 90% of all Jewish philanthropy goes to non-Jewish causes. Now, I love the fact that we're generous and that we care about all of God's children. I love that Jewish philanthropists and Jewish charity goes to African-American causes and Latin American causes and Catholic and Christian. But you kind of have to wonder why we are not more of a priority to ourselves. And that has to do with the deterioration of Jewish identity at this time. Uh, where does Jewish identity come from? It comes from Jewish religion, Jewish observance. It comes from Israel. It comes from Jewish pride. It comes from uh, Jewish history. And given the forgetfulness about things like the Holocaust, 68% of Americans never heard of Auschwitz, according to the New York Times. Um, given the given high levels of assimilation, given um, how many Jews are just not connected to Israel, we do see a deterioration of support. Now, there are good things that are happening. Yeah, birthright Israel is connecting hundreds of thousands of young Jews. Um, but the best thing that's happening is that Israel is really forging its own way right now. Israel used to be seen as kind of the poor Jewish cousin to American Jewry. That's not the case anymore. Israel today is a technological superpower. Thank God it's, uh, it's an agricultural superpower. It's becoming a diplomatic superpower. And it's a coronavirus superpower, thank God. It's done better than most countries in the world. And American Jews better wake up to the fact that they, they, they're thinking, well, Israel really needs us. And if we kind of frown on Netanyahu's policies or his government, we're not going to support Israel. It's the exact opposite is kind of true. Israeli Jews are looking at American Jews and they're saying, you know, we're going to be around in 50 years, God willing. We're not sure how strong your own communities in the United States are going to be in 50 years that you're, you're disappearing through rapid rates of assimilation and, and, the, um, and the deterioration of core institutions of American Jewry. And that's something that we really have to focus on, whether it's rebuilding synagogues, uh, temples, you know, of every denomination, but just instilling a strong Jewish identity, but especially getting American Jews to feel connected to Israel. Because Israel's the ancient Jewish homeland. And as the Talmud says, if you don't have a home, then your very humanity is compromised. Israel gives every American Jew great pride. Uh, and that was Herzl's original vision. It wasn't only that there would be a place for Jews to flee from European antisemitism. It would be that Jewish know-how would prove itself in building a state that would be a wonder and a miracle to the world, which is what Israel has become. Are you one of the rabbis or Jewish leaders of major reputation that believes, this is my theory, that for many American Jews, their religion has become progressivism under the slogan of tikkun olam, to heal the world, instead of Jewish values, and the, as the basis of those Jewish values, Zion and the return to Jerusalem. Well, it's a reason why we call our organization the World Values Network. We believe that universal Jewish values are the mainstay of Western civilization. And... Um, it's not even Judeo-Christian values, although we, of course, value the incredible friendship we have with our Christian brothers and sisters in general, the evangelical brothers and sisters in particular. But it's not even Judeo-Christian values. Uh, Jewish values preceded even that, universal Jewish values, the values of the Torah. And so many of my Christian brothers and sisters are now looking to discover the, the Jewishness of Jesus and understanding the life that he lived as a Jew in order to deepen their own affinity with Christianity. I wrote the book Kosher Jesus for that reason. Um, but whether progressivism is a new religion or not is kind of beside the point because it's not about whether Jews have abandoned Judaism in favor of supplanting it with something else. It's really about whether we can reconnect him with tradition. And that's one of the reasons that as a Chabad rabbi that I so value the legacy of the Lubavitcher Rebbe who believed that getting the, the Jewish community throughout the world to do just one mitzvah, you know, to put on tefillin just once or to light Shabbos candles just once or to go to a Pesach Seder, um, we Jews, when it comes to our tradition, are good at certain things. Uh, we're good at circumcision, which is 95% of Jewish boys. We're good at Passover, which is celebrated by 90% of Jews. We're terrible at other things. Um, and then we go to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur services, like probably 70% of us vowing to never go again except for those three days a year. Um, but we're terrible at other things. You know, we're only now discovering what Hanukkah is. It's almost, and we see it as like a Jewish Christmas, which it's not. It's really a great festival of Jewish liberation and how the Maccabees fought to be free and which is now captured by the state of Israel as it fights to be free. And the menorah is a universal symbol of Jewish freedom, Jewish and, and sorry, of, uh, of religious freedom, religious liberty. But we're just rediscovering so much of our tradition. 
Um, but Israel, Israel is, is a critical part of it because the rebirth of the Jewish people in their ancient homeland is that this great prophecy that the Jews would, would return. And it's almost like our Christian brothers and sisters really get it. They look at scripture, they look at the Bible, and they believe these prophecies, and they say, wow, it's happened. And the Jews are more like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, um, we, we're almost afraid to ascribe the divinity to our scripture the way our Christian brothers and sisters do so readily and do so easily. And maybe we have to kind of learn something from them in, in doing just that, in, in, in taking seriously the words of the prophets about a return to Zion and taking seriously the words of the Bible that through Israel and through the Jewish people, the whole world will be blessed. Well said. How can people find out about what you're doing? Oh, well, we need everybody's support and help. So the World Values Network, go to worldvalues.us, go to shmuley.com. One of the things that we're really good at, so many organizations in general, and Jewish organizations in particular, they focus on what I call bricks and mortar philanthropy. So their money goes, they put up beautiful buildings, schools, and they're all necessary. Our money doesn't go to that. Our money goes to national media campaigns to promote Jewish values and protect the state of Israel and stop genocide. Those are our three priorities. Promote universal Jewish values, making America a stronger nation, families, everything. Number two, defend Israel and stop the demonization of Israel and go on the attack against Israel's enemies in the media. And finally, um, stop genocide. Remember the six million, but stop all genocides and all human rights abuses in the name of never again. And uh, we raise millions and millions of dollars from people all over the world in large donations, smaller donations. And like I said, we are one of the largest full page advertisers in the history of the New York Times for advocacy ads. And we were very excited about it. Good for you. And I encourage all of our viewers, go check him out. He's a wise man. You'll learn something. And for those of you that haven't subscribed yet to our text message alert system, take out your cell phone, text the message truth in the message box and send it to 88202%. You'll be signed up. You'll get all of our shows like this one with Rabbi Shmuley Boteach absolutely for free on your cell phone every day. For Rabbi Shmuley Boteach, I'm Barry Newsbaum. Thanks for joining us on ATP Report.